Good morning, Atlantic Baptist Church family. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers who are here, to our stepfathers, to our foster fathers, to our grandfathers, uncles, mentors, men who have any role in a, in a child's life. We, we thank you and we honor you today. Um, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you've been able to join us today. And uh, yeah, we'll start with worship this morning if you want to stand with us. Worship His holy 
are slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the
I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy, super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey, hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Hmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Money really does grow on trees. <laughs> well, happy Father's Day. We are grateful that you're here, and we hope that you received a little gift if, when you came in. If not, there's lots at the front and at the back door. And for those who are watching online, you can stop in at the church this week. I won't open it in case you want to know that surprise, so we'll keep it a surprise. So wonderful, grateful that you are here with us today. Um, as you may have noticed when you walked in, we have a VBS display. We're really excited that that is coming up very soon. That's July 4th to 8th for children going into kindergarten to finish grade five. So we have some tags on the board and those are to help snack because we know snack is an important part of the morning. So if you are able to help um, Pick up a tag, we really appreciate it, and we see some things have already came back in this morning, so we want to thank you that. Um, next Sunday, our candidate for the Family Life Pastor will be here. We're really excited. The search committee will introduce him, and, and he will share as well. So I want to just encourage you, if you're able, to come uh, to come and, and meet him next, next Sunday, and then we will have a business meeting the following night on June 27th. In your bulletin, I just want to make a little uh, just clarification. On the back of your bulletin, uh, it says, Come and explore volunteer opportunities at St. George Baptist Church. We love Jason. But if you're wondering why are we promoting going volunteering at St. At, uh, at St. George Baptist Church, this was for Operation Christmas Child. So they are having a night uh, talking about Operation Christmas Child. They'll have a representative there from Operation Christmas Child. So if you've wanted to get involved in that organization, this is a night that you could come and learn more about it. So just to let you know that. We're going to dismiss our Union Street kids for their programs and grateful for all their teachers and leaders. <laughs> They're all coming. <laughs> Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you indeed are a good, good father. And we thank you, God, that you have given us earthly uh, fathers and stepdads and foster dads and uncles and next door neighbors, God, that have invested in our lives, that have brought encouragement. Um, so, God, we just pause and thank you. We thank you.
for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for all those boys and girls that ran out this morning to go to their own programs, God. And thank you just for their excitement that they have to come and learn more about you, to be with their friends. And God, may we have that same excitement as we come and gather and open your word and worship you. Because again, you're a good, good father. And that you love when we come and we worship, we sing praise, and we open your word to hear from you, God. So we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We thank you that you are here. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this song may be new to quite a lot of you. Um, I've known it for a very long time, and this song has some very deep, very encouraging words. So I just encourage you just to... um, Listen, and I encourage you to sing along if you know it.
thank you. <coughs> Beautiful. Let's pray. Dear, oops. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we again can run into your arms. We thank you, God, that in you we find safety, we find rest, we find your love, your goodness, your grace. A word of your love, a word of your hope, and we thank you, God, that we find that in you. God, this morning you recognize for those who are here and those who are watching online what type of a week they've had, that there's some that are come weary, weary from the burdens that they've been carrying, from the losses that they've experienced. Some are weary that they've just gotten over colds and COVID. Some are weary that are home that still are recovering from illness and not able to be here. God, you know each and every need. And we thank you that you meet them, that you speak to them, that you bring healing. So as we open this word this morning, we thank you, God, that we encounter you here. Open our hearts and our minds so that we can hear from you. And we give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you remember that stage you were as a child, or maybe you can remember your children, how they asked why for everything? Why does Grammy live so far away? Why do frogs jump? Why do I have to do my homework? Why do I have to go to bed? Why do we eat dessert last? The worst answer a parent could give their child was, because I said so. Sometimes it was, go ask your mother. But children have this curiosity, this curiosity to understand. And as we grow older, we're still to have this curiosity, still to ask questions. And when our children were younger, often the answers that we gave them, they were helping them to gain an understanding to the values that we were teaching, to the family script that we wanted them to live out. The Apostle Paul knew that understanding, how the why can bring clarity and build community. He lived out his why no matter where he was, whether it was in prison or in trial, in front of royalty or in front of everyday people at the temple courts. Paul experienced the life trans transforming power of Jesus and he wanted everyone to know about it, to embrace Jesus as their savior and experience being in community with God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the letter to Ephesus was all about God's action at work in our lives, both to restore our relationship to God and to restore our relationships to one another. God sent his son to take our blame, to bury shame and to restore us by his spirit into a relationship with him and with one another. This was and is an active relationship. And just as God was active and relentlessly pursuing people into relationship with him, reconciling and restoring the broken relationship by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, so God has called us, his adopted children, into his mission by the power of his Holy Spirit to be active in our lifestyle. Because when God's mission is carried out, people experience the kingdom of heaven 
There is more joy, more peace, more love, and more generosity. In the second half of Ephesians, Paul is calling the followers of Jesus to live out these kingdom values. He is challenging his readers to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, to partner with God on this mission, the mission of bringing hope and healing to people. Last week, we looked at our calling, and Paul laid out everything that God did for us so that we could be motivated by his love, desiring to be like Jesus so others could see Jesus in us, see that we are part of a new creation, a new humanity, and they could hear the gospel message. This is our calling as followers of Jesus, to participate in the saving power of Jesus by living for him. That first, God acted first, and we are to respond in a way that affirms our belief and our faith in him. As followers of Christ, we are to live a life with intentionality and purpose. And every step is to be done in love, that same love that had been poured out by the Father through Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are not called to be perfect, but to have our lives shaped by God's love and grace. Paul tells us, last week we talked about living a life worthy of the calling you have received, that you were called by God to walk with him, that you were designed to walk with his spiritual blessings, to let his favor go before you, and to let his power flow through you. You are his own, his beloved chosen child, his masterpiece. Yet, we often don't feel like a masterpiece, that we can look at ourselves with a lens of not being good enough, sometimes out of the love, the lens of judgment, not grace. We can focus on the things that we have done wrong instead of what Christ Jesus has done for us. Last week, we focused on chapter 4, verse 2. It says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient bearing with one another in love. This verse is to apply to ourselves as well. If we are not patient, not loving, not forgiving to ourselves, then we are not able to live that out. If we have not received that first and embraced that, that we are not able. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We need to see ourselves through the lens of how God sees us, his righteousness. And I know many people have a hard time with that word righteous. I've heard, oh, pastor, I am good. Well, I try to be good, but I am not righteous. And this is why this message is called A Masterpiece in Progress. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are indeed our God's masterpiece, that you become an heir, an adopted child of God through Jesus. This faith journey is just that. It's a journey, not a sprint. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. Well, what does it mean to be a new creation? You may have heard the term born again. And that's what it is, born again. It's a new creation called into a new humanity with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit that we are in community with God so that we can live with community with others. Paul spoke about this new humanity in chapter 4, verse 15, with Jesus as the head. He says, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, 
joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is a description of the church. We are one body, serving together, loving one another, and building one another. We are to grow together. But no Christian has ever been called to go alone in their walk of faith. God has fit us together as a church so that we can be encouragement to one another. Since we've been saved by grace, we walk in humility. And since we are called to be one, we are to walk in harmony. As new creations, we are to reject what destroys community and promote what builds community. In verse 22, it says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This verse is all about being a new creation, a new creation who thinks differently, looks differently, and does life with intentionality because they have a new identity. That's why he says to put off your old self and to bring on the new self. Now Paul is writing this letter to God's holy people in Ephesus. This is what we read in verse 3. Who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. This letter is one long letter. It's not broken up into chapters and verses how we have today. That when they would read this letter, they would read it all together so that they would understand the whole message. And Paul wants his readers to know the why and how they are to live now that they are new creations, now that they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, how they are part of a new humanity empowered by the Holy Spirit to be, live and, to be and live like Jesus. They are to forget their old identity and to remember who they are in Christ and how God sees them. An ancient Chinese proverb says, be careful of your thoughts, for your thoughts become your words. Be careful of your words, because your words become your actions. Be careful of your actions, for your actions become your habits. Be careful of your habits, for your habits become your character. Be careful of your character, for your character becomes your destination, your destiny. When we read that, it all talks about intentionality. C.S. Lewis has said, we are not metaphorically, but in very truth, a divine work of art, something that God is making and therefore something with which he will not be satisfied until it has a certain character. And Paul is encouraging us, encouraging the believers of Ephesus how to live out and how to be that character. And we know that character as of Jesus. Paul is challenging us what we need to take off, things that destroy community, things that kill unity, and put on things that build community, where humility and unity thrive. And Paul has, in the next few verses, a descriptive list, examples of things that destroy relationship and cause disunity and division, both in the church and in our homes and our workplaces and in communities. And he's calling us to put it off, to put off our own self and to put on a new self. Starting reading in chapter 4, verse 25. He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. 
In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that will benefit all those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just in Christ Jesus, for God forgave you. And chapter 5, verse 1, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. As new creations, we have a new identity. And we read earlier in verse 22 that we are to put off our old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. That it's amazing that when you're in the world that you can justify your own, your own actions. I deserve that. I'm not going to hurt anybody by doing this, saying this, receiving that. But he's saying in our attitudes, in our mind, to put on our new self. So think of this, this way, that as new creations, we have been given a new wardrobe. That we are to put on new clothes. Because our old clothes are tattered and tarnished, and frankly, they smell. They can repel others. Jesus is considered that fragrant offering because how he lived brought hope and healing to people. Paul says that we are created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. That we are to take off lies and put on truth. Instead of lying as new creations, we are to be truth tellers seasoned with grace and love. We are to take off anger and put on peace. Instead of bitterness, rage, and anger, new creations deal with peace, peaceful, peacefully with conflict. Nelson Mandela, after 27 years of imprisonment, he says, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I didn't leave my bitterness and anger behind, I would still be in prison. God is inviting us as new creations to take off anything that hinders the Holy Spirit, anything that hinders and destroys community. We are to take off thefts and put on, put on generosity. Instead of stealing, we are to live lives of generosity because we are trusting in God to provide all our needs. You may be familiar with the story of Zacchaeus found in Luke chapter 19, how he was a powerful and wealthy man who was a tax collector. And that when he encountered Jesus, his life was transformed. In fact, he told Jesus, up to half my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I will give them four times as much. That Zacchaeus, who was once known as somebody who stealed and cheated and lied, 
is now completely transformed with encounter with Jesus. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. And now Zacchaeus is to living this life of generosity. We are to take off gossip and put on encouragement. Instead of gossiping, we are to use words of encouragement. We are to ask ourselves, do our words build other people up or do they tear them down? I've heard this quote one time. It says, in the same way that gossip creates drama, peace is generated by using your words to lift people up instead of tearing them down. Proverbs 16.24 says, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. That is new creations that our words are to bring hope and healing, not curses and judgment, not gossiping about what that person has done or not, because with our eyes are to look on people with the same love and mercy that God has looked on with us. You see, the mouth and heart are connected. Our mouths reveal our hearts. And Paul told us to speak in such a way that we are to build up our hearers and not tear them down. Our words should minister grace and to help people draw closer to Jesus. Our enemy, the evil one, is all about destroying relationship, causing disunity, causing division, destroying the work of the church. That we are to be mindful of that. And that's why we are to live in such intentionality of the words that we speak and the actions that we do. Paul's solution to walk in God's way is by getting rid of anger and being an imitator of God is to forgive one another the same way God has forgiven us. We are to take off re revenge and put on forgiveness. Instead of getting revenge, we're to forgive others as we have been forgiven. That I think of the story of Joseph, that Joseph was sold into slavery for his brothers out of their own jealousy. And then as he became a slave in Potiphar's house, it tells us in Genesis 39 that day after day, day after day, Potiphar's wife tried to entice Joseph in sleeping with her. And he said, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? How could I do such a wicked thing against Potiphar who's given me everything and trusted me with everything that he owns? And it says that... He fled from her, and as he fled from her, he left his cloak. And then she accused him, and then he was thrown in prison. We are to take off promiscuity and put on self-control. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new creations cultivate self-control. Joseph chose to put his trust in God. And instead of seeking revenge for being sold into slavery, wrongly imprisoned and, and abandoned in prison, he had forgiveness. And his forgiveness brought healing, not just to his brothers, but to a whole nation. In Genesis 50, 20, which is kind of the bookmark of this chapter of Joseph. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph saw that his life was not just about him, but his life reflected the character and goodness of God. That he saw how God was faithful in all things in his life. And that he encountered God, and it transformed the way he thought and he acted. Paul is challenging us what we need to take off. Things 
again, that destroy community, that cause disunity, that cause division, and to put on things that build community where humility and unity can thrive. And we can look at this list and we can think, well, I could do this one okay and that's not a problem. That's a little bit of an issue. And as that song that Joanna and Carol so beautifully sang, that we can run to the Father, that we are not to do life on our own, but it's in, in the power with his spirit. That when we recognize that we have trouble with any of these things, that we are go to the Father, that we are not to stay hidden in secret. There's so many of, of the sins of the world that, that, that you see that it could be on display. And then there's others that are done quietly and that you don't see them. And you think that person looks like they have it all together, but God knows differently. And he's calling us to bring forth it into the light. Because when we keep things hidden, that darkness still has power over it. That we were designed to be in relationship with God and with others. That we, as new creations, we are to take off the tattered, tarnished clothes. Clothes that harm relationships, that destroy families and communities. And put on the brand new and beautiful that is found in Christ Jesus. The question that God is asking us today is what tattered, tarnished peace is God calling you to take off? What is it that is hindering the Holy Spirit in your life? What is it that you know that is, that is causing division, that is causing problems, strife in your relationship with your spouse or with your children or in your workplace? And God is asking you to identify that to have the courage to come to him and say, Father, this is not of you. And just like all our clothes, I'm notorious for spilling something on myself. That God in his grace and mercy is able to see it and is able to say, I can wash you clean. I can help you with that spot or that tear. But you need to come to me, not just once, not just one time, but it's to be in a relationship with him every day, not just on Sundays, not just for an hour a week, but every day we are to run to the Father, that his arms are open wide, that he is this compassionate, loving Father who sees you in this broken, fallen world and wants to come beside you. And it wants to use you to bring hope and healing into your family, into your community. Because he sees you in the lens of Jesus. He sees you as righteous. What do you need to take off so that you can live in that freedom that Jesus has offered you? Again, Jesus came to take away our shame, to bury it, and that as Christ has, has resurrected from the dead, that we have that same power, that same life-giving power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us, that we just need to ask the Father for that help, for that encouragement, and we know that he is his compassionate, compassionate father. So what is it, that tattered, tarnished peace that God is calling you to take off? And to know with love and mercy that God wants to help you in it. And that he has called us as a church to look with people with love and mercy as he has looked with love and mercy. And if we are able to do this as Paul has encouraged us to do, wow, incredible things would happen. Incredible things would happen. 
families would be restored. There would be a lot less divorce rates. There would be a lot more families intact. People would be able to come to church because they would feel it's a safe place to come to experience grace and mercy and not judgment. Paul is encouraging us to put on this new wardrobe, to put on this identity of Jesus Christ, that we are masterpieces. We may not feel like it. We may not feel that we look like it. But God is saying, yes, I can see that. Through all the tatteredness, I can see that. So may you embrace that. May you know that you are dearly, dearly loved. And God has a purpose and a plan for your life, that you are part of his master plan. So we are to reject what destroys community and promote what builds community. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you again that we can run to you, that your arms are always open wide, that we thank you, God, that we can come to you and ask you for help, that we can ask you how we have trouble with our anger, trouble with our words, trouble with that sight that we keep visiting, trouble showing forgiveness, letting bitterness and anger leave us for the injustices that have been done. Thank you, God, that is a power of your Holy Spirit that can help us do that. And God, we recognize that it's heavy, and that's why you've come alongside us. So we thank you for your love, your mercy, your compassion. Help us, God, to get rid of those things, to destroy those things that destroy community. And help us, God, build those things, promote those things in our life that build community and that gives you honor and glory. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
can come before you and just lay down all these things that we can take off the old and put on the new. Because Father, it is truly your desire that we become a new creation. And Father, we can only do that through you. We can try. But only you can make us new. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this message this morning. We thank you for this Father's Day. We just lift up all fathers again, dear God. Pray over them. Bless them mightily. These fathers are needed even more today. Father, just let the fathers step forward and just speak. Speak your name, dear God. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this worship. And as always, dear God, we give you all the praise and all the glory in your mighty name. Have a great day, everybody.